Okay, and we're live now, so it's uh, three, two, one, and hello, and welcome to Talk Gnosis, the web's talk show about Gnosticism, Gnostics, uh, religion, religious history, uh, Jesus, and whatever else we feel like talking about today. We've got uh, an awesome topic with two awesome guests. Uh, joining me are Dr. James McGrath and Dr. Sarah Parks. And uh, we're discussing uh, Dr. McGrath's book, uh, What Jesus Learned from Women. We are discussing uh, uh, Dr. Park's book, uh, Gender in the Rhetoric of Jesus and Women, and probably discussing some of the issues about Jesus and women. Uh, Dr. McGrath, Dr. Parks, hello, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting us on. Yes, excited to be here, Jonathan. Thank you. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a real pleasure. And it's obviously, uh, for the, the Talk Gnosis fans out there, that they know uh, uh, Dr. McGrath, uh, an all-time champion. We're going to have to send him a, a trophy at this point. <laughs> this might be time number six. I'll double check. Um, Dr. Park, somehow, this is her first time, and uh, hopefully not last time, but you could say that she's worked as a behind-the-scenes consultant on the show, because I'm sure I've messaged you questions being like, do you know who I could book for this? Or what did you think of this episode? <laughs> so... It's true. Um, yes. Okay. So I, I guess uh, I, I will start with James. If you can just tell us uh, a little bit about the book and, and why you gave it its, its evocative title and you know, what you mean by the title. Yeah, absolutely. And first of all, let me say that um, I'm hoping that, you know, since I don't really have a shelf for trophies, um, a t-shirt would be better, right? So, okay. Um, yeah, hopefully with a place where, you know, I can update if, if I come on for a seventh time, you know, I can switch the number out on the shirt. There's a patch or something, so. Yeah, or, a patch. Or, or badge, yeah. so. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but yes, the, the book is one that uh, in many respects surprised me. Um, not one that I immediately, when I had the idea, uh, envisaged would turn into a book. Uh, it emerged out of conversation with uh, a, a would-be um, honors student, or I should say an honor student who uh, was trying to think of topics with me that uh, could allow her to explore her uh, sense of being a feminist and of being a Christian and how and whether those two fit together. But <clears throat> the title of the book has gotten a lot of attention, not least because for a lot of people, they think of Jesus in a way that precludes the possibility of him learning. And, of course, that's going to intersect with uh, a lot of uh, literature that uh, may be better known to some of your listeners and to you than it is to uh, many people in churches, uh, some of the early Christian texts in which yeah, Jesus really is divine, whether he's human, debatable, or you know, denied outright, more or less, in practice, if not in theory. And so it's been interesting to see how the, how the book has raised those questions. Uh, but this book is really about Jesus as a human being and trying to trace uh, some some of the people that influenced him and influenced his thinking, influenced his practice, influenced his emphases. And the reason the book is not the perhaps more obvious and simpler title, What Women Taught Jesus, but What Jesus Learned from Women, is due to the simple fact that I think Jesus learned from women at times when they didn't know he was learning from them, right? He's uh, pointing them from a, a distance or right, the the uh, the impact is seen only later and so putting it that way seemed the most appropriate way to approach it very cool very cool and what's what and have you had some pushback on that title have you got any comments being like jesus doesn't need to learn anything oh yes um <clears throat> yes there's there's an app there's a one star amazon review uh that uh uh, basically takes that that tack. <laughs> Thank you for the, <laughs> the sympathetic face there, Sarah. <laughs> yes, it's it's like because it, yeah. Um, but I, I I largely sidestep those issues in the book, and I'm probably going to uh, need to put together a study guide or discussion guide so that I just help people really think about. Okay, so if you want to get into the questions of Christology and theology that go beyond the book, how to do so. I, the, the, the short answer is, if I had come down and said, here's how you should think of Jesus as human and or divine and or, you know, two natures, one nature. What, you know, 
anything that you come down on excludes some people who might otherwise uh, be able to engage with the substance of the book. And so sidestepping the issue within its pages seemed like the wisest choice, but it's not, it's not ideal in certain ways. And people have both been pushing back on the idea and also asking, okay, so what does this mean for the way I view Jesus? Yeah, for sure. And for those out there, I, I would highly recommend uh, uh, getting the book um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one being that uh, it, it's it's quite well written, uh, extremely well written, James. So it moves along at a good clip. It's fun to read. Um, and a, a, another reason, too, is it's, you know, a book of serious scholarship, but uh, it leaves a lot of room open, I think, for people of faith. Uh, there's a lot of space in there to read it from a variety of perspectives, and I think it works within a variety of perspectives. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, something, something that I wasn't expecting that that, that was really neat is uh, James wrote these um, very imaginative, in the, all the best senses of the words, uh, intros to each chapter from the perspective of the women in it. So, so they're recreating those uh, very brief um bible passages that describe the story giving the story much more depth so yes james it was uh it, it was a real real pleasure to read it um so uh the dr parks since we're talking about uh jesus and his relationships uh to women and perhaps women he was teaching and some of his teachings around women maybe you can help me understand uh something deeply connected to, to women in uh, uh, the Gospels, which is uh, the gender pairings and Q. I was wondering if you could just explain what those are you know, relatively quickly, because um, I, I know that they, that can be a deep, uh, a deep topic. Sure, that's what my book is about. It's called Gender in the Rhetoric of Jesus, and it focuses on what Jesus said. So it's on the sayings material of Jesus, and one thing I notice when we just look, um, stripping away the gospel um, narratives and biography that they put on to explain Jesus many decades later, um, stripping that away and just looking at what was this man teaching that people remembered and what were those teachings like. And within Jesus' teaching, uh, people have noticed a gendered pairing a doubling of telling the same story twice, the exact same story, but telling it once so that the women in the audience can see themselves in it by using a female protagonist. And then again, so that the men in the audience can see themselves in it by featuring a male protagonist. So what does this look like? Uh, anyone who knows the New Testament will recognize some of the stories that are paired, but they may not realize they're paired. For example, um, the lost sheep, the story of the lost sheep and the story of the lost coin. Um, those are two stories that Jesus told. One is about a man, a shepherd, who had 99 sheep, but he lost one of them and he goes out searching for it and gets it back and rejoices. And then the same story is told, but there's a woman who's in her home and she realizes she had 10 coins, but she has lost one of them. So she scours the house, sweeping, looking everywhere on the floor. She finds the coin and she rejoices. These little teaching stories, um, Jesus used them a lot. And there are a number of times when he has these gendered pairings. Some of them are hidden uh, where there's no people at all in the story. So you would never think that they had anything to do with gender. Like the story of the, there's a twin story of the ravens and the lilies that Jesus tells. He talks about these uh, ravens who don't have to plant and harvest and store up seeds in barns, and yet God feeds them. And then the, the twin story is about, look at the lilies, they don't have to card wool or spin or weave garments, and yet they look so beautiful. Um, it's just a flower and a bird. So how is that gendered? Well, the work done by the that the raven doesn't have to do the um, planting, harvesting, and storing grain is at the time mostly work of men, and the work done by the lily that she doesn't have to do the uh, carding of wool, uh, making 
uh, sheep's wool into yarn and spinning it into clothing. It's women's work at the time. So Jesus deliberately, is what my book says, crafted stories in order to be inclusive of women in the audience. He did not craft different stories for the women that taught a different lesson. Hmm. He told the same story in a way that men and women could see themselves in it and respond to. It was identical kind of intellectual material and identical kind of religious urgent message. Um, no separate stories for the ladies. It was men and women, this message is for you and, and I include women deliberately. So that's what my book is about. Yeah. And I also hyped that one up as well because it's uh I, I believe James uh, your yours is for a more popular audience while Sarah's is still um perhaps more for scholars. Um but uh Sarah I as a nerd who reads a lot of scholarly uh texts as uh, for fun <laughs> um yours is is definitely one of the more and most readable uh uh uh, text I've read in a long time <laughs> to come out of an academic publisher. So just your your writing style and the clarity of uh, how you impact the uh, concepts. I think perhaps people out there who uh, aren't deep into the academic weeds or, or don't engage with the stuff, I would say definitely, you know, maybe you're scared off from a more academic uh, book. I'd say def definitely grab this one as uh, Dr. Park's prose and explanatory style lays it out quite well. So. And also works as a general introduction to Q because you do take some time in that book just to explain what Q is. Um, what was I going to say? Another great, another great part of that book is a great generosity of spirit when you come to looking at possibilities and making conclusions. Uh, I was just really impressed with uh, really leaving some things open um, instead of uh, saying uh, this is exactly what it is and exactly what happened. Anyways, great book. Everybody get that one. Um, question for both of you. So these, these gendered pairs that Sarah was telling us about and, and Jesus having uh, teachers uh, uh, who were women, th this must have created, must have meant that, that we had a uh, progressive, um, um, uh, radically feminist Jesus. So uh, a Jesus who could who could go to a feminist meeting, you know, right now, and everything he says would would um, would gel right in. Is is that correct? You know that we're gonna say no, no, no. We're historians. Things are murkier than that. You've jumped to the extreme conclusion. Um, yes, that is that has been a problem of feminist Christian scholarship that sees a lot of women around Jesus, women patrons, as James points out, women uh, teachers and mentors, uh, women followers, women disciples. You, feminist Christian theologians or historians have seen that and have jumped too far to a quote unquote feminist Jesus. Um, but feminism didn't exist in the first century. And one thing I point out in my book is you can't start history with Jesus you've got to go back further. And when you go back further into the second temple period of Judaism and the few hundred years before Jesus in the late the late Republic, there, there were lots of things happening where women were becoming more publicly active. There were Jewish queens, there were women philosophers, there were women, if not writers, women patrons of important texts. Um, and there were, you know, women political activists. Look at the women Maccabees, at the time of the Maccabean revolt, who would rather die than um, forsake Torah, for all kinds of reasons. The answer is yes, Jesus was inclusive of women, deliberately um, surrounded by women, but no, Jesus was not some kind of the first Jew ever to be kind to women and rejecting Judaism in being more progressive. It's not like that, it's more complicated. Jesus was inclusive of women within his second temple Jewish context. Right. And is there also a, as well as a problem when, when we kind of get into the, the thought that, that you're describing, where you have a progressive feminist Jesus uh, fighting against a patriarchal Jewish establishment? Isn't this a, a kind of construct that, that many people create um, and, and would you say that's accurate? 
uh, that it's a, a construct or that it's a problem or yeah, there's oh, it certainly oh, is yeah. Oh, sorry. Is it is it does it reflect reality? Do you think it reflects history? <laughs> um, that's accurate. Then, yeah. If that's the question, then I'd say no. Uh, I think it's important to emphasize that you know, as as Sarah's been saying, that Jesus is a Jewish man, clearly with some male role models who uh, had positive views of women, right? And so he's not alone in that regard, uh, who is listening to women, mostly Jewish women, although there's uh, there's one Syrophoenician or Canaanite who really gives her gives him a piece of her mind and uh, you know he listens to her too, at least eventually, but <clears throat> mostly Jewish women. And so uh, there's evidence for female leadership and uh, things like that that doesn't mean that this isn't a patriarchal context, right? Any more than today saying that, you know, there there's a feminist movement, there have been great strides towards equality means that women are paid equally and for the, doing the same work as men and things like that, right? And so just as our time is complicated, right? We can say that, you know, we've made progress and we still have a long way to go. Uh, we can say that in Jesus' time, the situation was complicated. Right? He certainly wasn't the only one who was saying this. And doing justice to that is important, not just in order to understand Jesus in his context accurately, but also in order to avoid the, the sort of anti-Semitism that often emerges in the interest of making Jesus seem uh, superior to better than anyone and everyone. And so the place you start when you are inclined to do that, of course, is everything that is in Jesus' immediate context, right? Contrast him with that, and what you end up with is a very anti-Jewish portrait that misses how much of what exists in Jesus' time, uh, the influences on him, are crucial to his distinctive, you know, his distinctive attributes and emphases. Yeah. I, I wonder, too, if there's even, I think sometimes when we think of theological positions, um, uh, being read into to history when when we think of the the perfect Jesus that perhaps might be uh, something that that we wouldn't find as uh, as much in say progressive um, mainline uh, churches um, but they may not have a, a perfect Jesus in their theology but he'd be perfectly feminist um, due to mm -hmm being the, the son of God and hence superseding history. Am I making sense I, in, in the more liberal church traditions? So I guess I'm just commenting on how uh, ideas that we really want to see that perhaps our society would rank currently as either positive or negative are really read back in, in very powerful ways and connected to ideas that are both theological and historical. Um, James, uh, Obviously, we can't go through your your entire book with 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 each of, of, of Jesus's women's teachers, uh, although that would be awesome. <laughs> but it would probably make for a long show. But um, if you could, uh, you, you bookend the uh, the book with, uh, with with the two famous Marys. But maybe we could talk about Mary the mother. If you could just tell us a little bit of, about what what you think Jesus uh, learned from her, the most important points, um, and and how you may have you know. Uh, received this information since so much in the, the Gospels is so scant, you know, terse, um, not a lot of background. Yes, and just picking up on your your previous point, I think I think there's a tendency to see Jesus as perfectly whatever it is that uh, one's church denomination, whatever it is, uh, emphasizes. Right. So right. whether Jesus is perfectly conservative or perfectly progressive, uh, there is a tendency to have Jesus embody everything that a particular Christian tradition stands for, and then you know, set him up as the ideal of that in contrast to everything that uh, went before him and was around him. And so both both the liberal and conservative ends of Christianity can can get into that same pitfall of making, making a, a stark contrast that doesn't do justice to history and, and to the humanity of Jesus. And so the reason I start with Jesus's mother is that I really couldn't start anywhere else. Um, it's interesting. There's there's a discussion group that is uh, discuss. They started their discussion of the book with a discussion of should we go through this in order? And there are some who were 
saying, well, you know, the, the author put them in this, <laughs> the chapters in this order, so let's do it that way. Uh, but there was somebody, a, a, a fellow New Testament scholar who's also a member of the clergy who kind of was instrumental in bringing the group together, who said, well, we should start with some of the stories about Jesus and his public ministry because there the historical evidence is stronger, right? There's a, a more solid case of that sort to be made. And I was really in two minds about where to start, right? Because there are stories like the story of Jesus' encounter with the Syrophoenician woman that really are, in a sense, the classic go-to example of Jesus being influenced by a woman. And yet, unless you deny Jesus' humanity entirely, he was influenced by his mother, right? Mothers are formative influences on human beings. Um, if if the mother survives childbirth, obviously, which obviously which didn't always happen in the ancient world and doesn't always happen even today, but assuming the presence of the mother, uh, the mother is the primary formative and in many ways decisive influence. It was interesting having a chance to talk with somebody from the Times of Israel about this. Uh, I steered clear of of stereotypes. A lot of people don't know that I have. Uh, Jewish ancestry on my matrilineal uh, genealogical tree. And so somebody named McGrath commenting about you know, Jewish mothers and stereotypes. People might think that I'm stereotyping rather than talking from my own experience. But I was so glad that the person I was talking to from the Times of Israel was like, so Jewish mothers and their sons, let's start there. Right? But I think that you know, Mary, <laughs> there's a lot we can assume, you know, both you know, culturally, but also uh, just generally humanly, but then we also have something that the New Testament sources actually emphasize, right? I mean, the Gospel of Luke, right, it's the only one that tells us specifically and explicitly Jesus learned, right, that he grew in wisdom and in either maturity or stature, right, and presumably both. Growing in wisdom involves learning, and Luke is the only one who gives us sort of what did Mary stand for, right? What did she emphasize in the form of the Magnificat? Right? And so giving us those two things and not giving us anything from Joseph, right, I might add, that is equivalent, and then presenting the teachings of the adult Jesus as emphasizing social justice, right? The, the lifting up of the poor and the bringing down of the rich and the inversion of, of status and things like that. He's conveying to us and I don't think accidentally, right? He's conveying to us that he views Mary as having influenced Jesus, having taught him, right? Jesus reflects the things that his mother taught him. And there are lots of questions one can ask about the historicity of that, but given that Luke acts, depicts Mary as an ongoing part of this movement, I mean, we could, I think we have to either say, yes, this, this is, there's some historical basis to this, not necessarily that Mary spontaneously came up with a perfect poem on this particular occasion or anything like that, but that the gist of it conveys something that has a historical core. Or either, either that or Mary eventually got on board with Jesus' teaching and then uh, claimed credit for it all, um, which is presumably not entirely impossible, but I'm more inclined to the, the former possibility. Um, in the Magnificat, you know, there, there is a, that famous, um, cry for justice. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that it's some of what now we would call social justice uh, uh, Jesus inherited from his mother? Yes, I think so. Um, and I think, again, that's that's something that uh, goes back to you know, ancient Israel's prophets, right? So it was, it was there uh, and fairly widespread in Judaism. Jesus certainly wasn't the only person uh, emphasizing these things. Uh, as with so many of our, our cultural values today, right? Uh, the fact that something is a cultural value doesn't mean that most people are actually doing it, right? And so you get these people who are calling for people uh, not to change their values, but to uh, actually live according to the values that they affirm in theory and then um, ignore in practice. And I think that that teaching, those things that were part of Mary's form of influence, set Jesus on a trajectory that at least let led him to be open to some of the things that he learned later, uh, some of the increasing inclusivity, uh, increasing concern for justice, uh, recognizing how the, the boundaries of his vision might need to expand to include others. And so one of the things that really I think is, is, is an exciting 
consequence of the book, not really something I focus on there, but a potential historical consequence is that this may give us at long last the opportunity to not just have these little tidbits about Jesus that we think are probably historical, but we're not sure how to organize them, right? We might actually be able to, to trace some developments across time in the life of Jesus. Yeah, very cool. Uh, well, that is a, a neat thing that you you do do in the book as well, as you seem to, you have connected sayings um, and say, well, you know, this 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 later one super, perhaps might supersede it because he had grown. <laughs> he, had, he had had a realization from a woman teacher and then decided that uh, he wanted to teach this in a different way or that this concept needed to be tweaked <laughs> or uh, what have you. So, uh, yeah, it's a, a very, uh, uh, very, very, very cool stuff. Thank um, you. And one of, one of the things I do want to say is that uh, hopefully you, you, you may have noticed uh, Sarah Parks' books influence there, right? Um, actually tell a story. Uh, there are lots of instances in which we don't know exactly which woman might have influenced Jesus, like which ones set, sort of called him out and said, you know, we women don't always see ourselves in these stories that you tell just about men. And then he says, okay, well, maybe I better... Uh, expand my scope of storytelling here. But you know, after reading her book, I was like, okay, that's that's got to feature in one of these vignettes and that's got to be in there somewhere, right? And has to be reflected in this because presumably Jesus doing that reflects him listening to women and you know that particular aspect. And so, uh, yeah, was was really excited reading her book. Um, glad it came out before I um, was finishing my book and not, uh, not later when I would have said, oh, I should have included that. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, you know, that actually leads into another question I, I had about the, the gendered pairs, which you've kind of touched on, Sarah, but um, which is, you know, why, why did Jesus do them and, and why, what did they mean to the women listening to them and what did they mean to the men listening to them? So when the men heard the uh, one of these gendered pairs and when a woman heard it and, and Jesus and, and Jesus and Jesus's intent as, as much as you can, of course, recreate and understand these things. Yeah, but there's so much we don't know and have to use our imagination, which yeah. I, I really appreciate about James's book. He owned the fact that historians have to use our imagination and he did a beautiful job. But um, so Jesus became a God in a major world religion. And that creates for historians an awful lot of baggage. It makes it more difficult than for other characters in antiquity to, to piece together what was going on. But something we often forget is before the Christ, before Christianity, Jesus, the guy in Nazareth, had an awful lot of followers that had a very positive image of him and would throw away their normal lives and follow him for his message. That message has to have been compelling. It must have filled a need and been compelling. He must have been a smart, relevant teacher. And what do we see when we look at the stories that he told that have come down to us through the New Testament? We see a teacher who pulls from exactly what's around them in rural Galilee. He doesn't teach about kings and palaces or courts. He teaches about mustard seeds, yeast, making bread, fishing. Um, and so while many feminist uh, Christian theologians have said, oh, look, Jesus talked to women and talked about women, and therefore he is a feminist. I mean, that's something you can do with your imagination and say, like, therefore we should include women. But as a historian, what I think Jesus was doing was simply seeing, okay, I, I have these people around me. Some of them are women. I got a tailor. I have to tailor this to them because I need them. Why did he need them? Because he was a uh, part of the stream of Judaism in the late Second Temple period that was apocalyptic, which is an urgent uh, a belief that things are unjust in the extreme and that God has to intervene and fix things radically very soon. In other words, the end of the world, some kind of big shift is coming. It's an urgent message. And Paul has it too. If you lay out the New Testament, not in the order in which it was canonized, but in 
chronological order, the earliest bits and the movement around the historical Jesus and around Paul have an urgency. The world is ending Tuesday. And so at that point, things like gender and class, uh, enslaved people and wealthy people, they're all like eating together in community. Um, for Paul, even Jews and non-Jews are, are those boundaries are all breaking down and gender is a boundary that you know when things are going great and you're in high society you can have all kinds of gendered expectations but when it's all hands on deck the apocalypse is arriving gender doesn't matter because everything's going to change and so what i what i say in my book is that yes jesus included women but no not because he was a 21st century feminist but because he was an apocalyptic uh, Jew and a good teacher who tailored his stuff to what to whoever was listening and women were there. That's what I think. Yeah. Um, James, coming back to a question that perhaps doesn't uh, affect your entire thesis, but it, it's of course fun to read a book and you see something that grabs your attention as, as the interviewer and you, you just want to hear a little follow up on it. But I was wondering if you could talk about uh, what Jesus may have learned uh, from his grandmother about theater. Oh, I think you're muted. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. I was. Uh, yeah. Given that later on, Jesus is sort of hobnobbing with uh, some uh, wealthy and influential women, there certainly may have been influence of an exposure to theater via them. But there's this interesting tradition that Jesus' parents, uh, or sorry, his mother's parents were from Sepphoris, right? This major city uh, had previously been the capital of the Galilee, which was not far, right? It was uh, just a few miles uh, ancient in ancient terms and uh, some healthy people's modern terms, walking distance from Nazareth. And it had a theater. Uh, which was expanded in later times, but there seems to have been one in Jesus' time. And so it's it's scarcely conceivable that Jesus never went there. And one of the questions that sometimes gets asked is, why didn't it get mentioned, right? Why do a number of the cities that were major cities uh, not get the focus of attention? But I think it's it's entirely possible that this this tradition has some has some historical roots to it as well. Uh, not least because Sepphoris doesn't get mentioned in the New Testament, right? And oftentimes when people are inventing stories, they, they draw on biblical material, they draw on things that are familiar to them. And so this place that would have been familiar to Jesus and his family, but once the gospel, once the Christian message moves outside of that vicinity, is not going to be sort of an, an everyday name. It's, it would be surprising if that tradition gets completely invented then. And Jesus does draw on terminology from theater, and that's often missed. Right? We have this term in English, hypocrite, which actually is a, essentially a transliteration of a Greek word. And that word didn't mean what hypocrite means in English, right? It meant sort of acting, right? Play, playing a role. And in a theater, not in one of the biggest cities in the Greco-Roman world. The most likely form of theater that Jesus would have been exposed to there, if he was exposed to it at all, would have been pantomime, right? Where you may, may have one person who's putting on a show and switching their masks according to which role they're playing. Right? And so Jesus uses this phrase in a distinctive way. Uh, according to the gospel tradition, he uses that term more often than anything that we get in existing literature would have led us to expect. And he uses it to make a point that shapes what the word comes to mean for us in English. Mm. And so, again, figuring out exactly where and when Jesus encountered that, I think there may have been more than one place, but growing up in the vicinity of a city that had that should be part of that picture. And so asking about contact with the big city, asking about those kinds of things, Connecting that with my exploration of influences on Jesus, including family influences, uh, seem, seemed appropriate. Yeah. Um, 
I'd like to ask you both about um, Mrs. Christ, Mrs. Jesus Christ, um, Mary Magdalene. If uh, James, you actually you actually spent uh, a lengthy, a significant uh, uh, amount in, in the, your chapter on Mary Magdalene, uh, you know, sort of talking about these these very popular uh, common ideas uh, about them being married. Um, but uh, I know it's probably a topic that you're you both have been asked about in the past. So yeah, was uh, was Jesus and Mary Magdalene married? And, and what would that mean if they were? Well, I mean, I think no, they weren't. I think that uh, the response to Mary Magdalene has been over the years, starting probably the worst offender was Pope Gregory. Um, but the response to her has been to whether positively or negatively, sexualize her whether to say like oh she was in a sexual relationship with jesus uh, and to say it positively or negatively to say oh you know mary magdalene was a harlot um as if as if sex work means that she should be disparaged but over the centuries people cannot handle the mary magdalene that is not best known for some form of sexuality. They can't handle what is in the historical record, which is major financial patron and benefactor of the movement in the inner core of disciples traveling around with Jesus, um, only consistent witness to the resurrection across the four uh, accounts. So basically the, the link to the resurrection story comes through one, one character. Um, all of the things, at, I mean, this is all just in the New Testament. The earliest references to her are disciple, a patron, benefactor, follower. Um, even the fact where it probably the way that they met was she came to Jesus movement, movement as a wealthy woman for healing because it says seven demons went out of her. That does, that does not, uh, that does not mean in antiquity she was evil, possessed, or anything like we put onto the word demon possession now. It, demons were science in the first century. Demons were toothaches, headaches. So the fact that she had seven demons meant that she was very ill uh, in some way. And so she probably experienced healing at the hands of Jesus and joined the movement and gave her her finances to it. So, uh, if they had been married or in a sexual relationship, um, there's no reason why it wouldn't be mentioned. Jesus, uh, there was be no shame in him being married. It was weirder that he wasn't and weird that Paul wasn't. But they were, again, apocalyptic Jews. Jesus and Paul were in a movement that felt the end of the world was going to be very soon. Getting married at that time was foolish because there's no time. It's all hands on deck. So. Uh, no, I, I don't think there's any evidence for Mary Magdalene being In fact, I think she was probably quite a bit, uh, she was probably elderly. Because why did she drop out of the tradition so quickly afterwards? She probably passed away. She was probably more the age of his mother. That's my take on it. I don't know. Maybe James thinks differently. No, no, um, and you, you've 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 seen the book, so you you have a sense of this. Um, I, and I'd be very curious to hear after after I say a few things whether uh, that conclusion that uh, Mary Magdalene is probably older is one that you re reached independently, uh, because it's it's one it's a conclusion that I drew uh, based on you know on the one hand her the sense that we get that she's independently wealthy and influential in this movement and a, a you know a patron of it, but also the fact that. In uh, the Gospel of Philip, we have this this interesting text that says that you know Mary, um, that Jesus loved Mary more than you know the other disciples and used to kiss her frequently on the, and then there's this whole Lacuna. manuscript, right? We wish we knew what was in there, uh, but if if this is you know somebody who you know is is being sexualized in either of the major ways that people have done so, including if this is Jesus' wife. It's like he loved his wife more than the other disciples. It's like, how is this news, right? You know, and so trying to figure out how this can be sort of worth commenting on, and yet it's not something scandalous, you know, in that ancient context or in any other that the author can envisage. 
Uh, it's just something to mention as illustrative. And if if this is somebody who is like, you know, his mentor is is like, you know, sort of an honorary aunt, uh, may have been a friend of his mother's for all we know, right? I mean, we don't, we don't actually know. We know that families were connected and people knew one another in all sorts of ways. Oftentimes we're not told about those kinds of family connections and, you know, friends of family and things like that because there's so many relationships of this sort and it's so much taken for granted in this ancient context that it doesn't always bear mentioning and there's so many of them that you can't mention them all. And so, yeah, absolutely. And the, the one thing I sort of apologize for, you know, maybe shouldn't have, but felt like I needed to is that I really did make extra effort to try to make Mary interesting and yet not interesting in any of the ways that people who are looking for the sensational, you know, Jesus wife, Jesus lover, you know, reformed prostitute, anything like that, that tends to uh, characterize her in one of these ways that makes her identity sort of centered on, on sex in that way. I, I make her much more boring, but you know, therefore I think all the more significant that she is influential because she is close to Jesus. She's an influence on him and she's influenced by him. She is a mentor and a friend and she's part of the movement. And that's that makes her, I think, all the more significant in that she, she comes into clearer focus, not as a role for ancient women, but as a person, as a human being in her own right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm going to come back to you, James, just in a sec, because uh, I actually want to, to talk about what Jesus learned from her. But just sort of staying on this topic, maybe a question for both of you, but maybe starting with, with, with Dr. Parks. I, the, the idea of, of Jesus um, marrying Mary Magdalene, it does seem to have sort of a, a, a feminist impulse uh, on some level, right? Where you're really elevating uh, uh, her so that she is, you know, a co-equal partner with the most important uh, figure in Western history. But but I always thought that that that, that actually, in my opinion, uh, diminishes her. You know, for her to become Mrs. Jesus instead of. Um, a uh the, the figure that that she probably was you know an important benefactor of the movement perhaps a leader of the movement which we'll talk about with james what do you think of the, about that about that sarah how how that if i'm on to something there or that or that perhaps this the that we're uh, off the track while having good impulses <laughs> <laughs> yes i think a lot of um the impulse to elevate her by having her be very important to jesus as his wife is probably a, a feminist impulse, but at the same time, it reinforces the humanity, normal default humanity is heterosexual male. Mm. And so through what lens would we want to see Mary Magdalene as uh, sexualized? It's through a heterosexual male lens. Whereas it wouldn't it be a truer feminist impulse to see Mary Magdalene as human being. Um, if she were a male and that we had the same discourses around her, we wouldn't hesitate to uh, point out, okay, wealthy, financial benefactor, um, in the inner core, there's some jealousy from the other disciples. So therefore maybe she's smarter, uh, intellectually connects more with Jesus. He prefers talking to her because it's more um, rewarding for him, more on the same page. She gets it more. Um, it's more feminist to reward Mary Magdalene for what is in the record about her, um, which is, it's not sexualized. Even that one um, lacuna in the text where it, one of the uh, later texts of about Jesus and Mary say, oh, he he loved her more than the other disciples and used to kiss her often on the, we don't know what. Um, like James said, if they were married, that, that wouldn't be worth mentioning. So it's obviously something not sexual. Maybe it's on the hand as a sign of great respect. Maybe it's on the forehead because she's like a little grandmother by that point. Maybe it's on the foot because he's like, oh, you teach me so much. We, we don't know, but there's no reason to take, to to make the jump to sexualizing her, whether positively or negatively. Yeah, well, I really hope that uh, Lacuna gets out of uh, 
just to use it for religious studies and can become the, the next hot slang word for uh, describing uh, body parts that you're not always supposed to be using the terms for in polite company. Um, <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, James, can you tell us what, uh, what Jesus actually learned from Mary Magdalene? Yes, well, certainly, I think just the, the fact that, you know, a, a woman can be, you know, mentor can be such an important part of the movement. Clearly, she she rises to to leadership, right? There is debate about her in extra-canonical texts uh, after the New Testament that are clearly debating, you know, either, either trying to appeal to her as an authoritative source or are indicating that there is an effort to denigrate her. Uh, and it's, it's striking that while the denigration often focuses on her gender, right? You get the voice of other you know, male apostles um, made to say, you know, would Jesus have entrusted his, you know, his, his special teaching to a woman and things like that? But it's not about her reputation. You know, it's not about her being former prostitute or uh, wife or lover or anything else of Jesus, right? And so we get some of the, the patriarchy and chauvinism and misogyny that's developing in uh, certain strands of early Christianity uh, coming through in that. But in the very process of debating about her and you know, attributing teaching to her in some instances, those things don't have to be historical to, for them to be as indicative as the appeal to other male apostles in pseudepigraphal works is that these were people who were recognized as central to the movement, as eyewitnesses, as teachers, as leaders, as trustworthy sources. And so that's one of the things. The other thing is, you know, I, I assume that the casting out of seven demons, which as, as Sarah emphasized you know, so nicely, doesn't mean you know, seven demons a la the exorcist or something like that, uh, not modern horror demons, but seven symptoms or seven ailments or something of that sort means that she had either ongoing issues, right? Or, you know, uh, things that kept coming back or things that were, you know, multifaceted in that regard. And so she was suffering a lot. And the highlighting of that indicates sort of the, the power of the healing, the extent of the healing that people experienced in and through what Jesus was doing. And if we're thinking about him as a human being, right, that conveys to Jesus that this is something different, right? There are lots of exorcists in this time, right? When Jesus first starts performing exorcisms and healings, that in itself doesn't set him apart. Right? It's when you see people being healed of ailments uh, or degrees of severity of illness that was outside the norm that you think, wow, you know, God is, God is doing something new here. And one particular example that I think, you know, Jesus must have looked in Mary's direction and smiled when he said this, if she was around at the time, uh, when he was using this in his teaching, when he said that, you know, if you cast out a demon, you know, an unclean spirit, and nothing else takes its place, right, it goes away, it finds seven of its friends and comes back and finds its house that it was living in, namely the person from which it was exercised. Uh, it's, it's, it's nicely swept, it's tidy, right? The exorcist has cleaned house, but nothing has taken, taken up residence there. No greater spirit, uh, no spirit of God has taken, taken, the, taken up residence there. And so it's like, hey, friends, hey, the house is clean. Come on over, let's all party. And the person is worse off. Yeah. And the fact that Jesus tells a story of a demon who brings along seven friends and is also said to have exercised seven demons from someone or at least in some way connected to him, right? Seven demons went out from her and she was uh, alleviated of that suffering. Those things seem to me to be connected. And so in, in, the, in the story as I tell it and in the, uh, the chapter as I dig into it further, I, I connect those things. Oh, very cool. Um, could you speak briefly, uh, in just sort of a broader question about a couple chapters, but um, we talked about sort of really direct relationships here, right, with, uh, with the two Marys. But I, I think some of them might surprise people uh, when they read the book is, is the healings, like, uh, are, are included in there. Um, so how, how do you see if, if Jesus is healing someone, how, how is he the one learning? Yes, and although this tends to, 
uh, diminish as a, a characteristic in the narratives as the tradition develops. In our earlier sources, and even sometimes in later ones, we get these hints that you know, Jesus you know, used spittle, right? He made a paste out of mud. Uh, he did things that led people to experience healing. And so he is someone who, at least initially, and at least some of the time, used approaches to healing that were known in that time. And when you use the same methods that other people are using, you, you learn them from somewhere. And in families, in, in household traditions, oftentimes uh, women, right, the older women were often the safeguard, uh, the, the guardians, right, the ones who safeguarded the passing on of knowledge about, you know, herbs and roots and things that could uh, be used in healing, about methods and approaches to things. And so I wove that into the story about Jesus' grandmother as well, because that seems like one possible source. But in these, in these stories of people experiencing healing, right, I think to the extent that Jesus seems to have gone from thinking that you know, Satan doesn't cast out Satan and you know, so the, the kingdom of Satan might stand, but you know, individual battles are being won, to the kingdom of Satan not standing, right? And this being the, the dawn of the kingdom of God and something, something different. Uh, it may be that that was something that was not there from the outset as Jesus uh, began you know, being part of the movement of John the Baptist, for instance, as he uh, had his first experience of you know, learning, learning healing and exorcism and things of that sort. And so there too, I think that seeing, seeing what people experience through what you do teaches you something. Yeah, exactly. Um... Dr. Parks, uh, it's really important part uh, in my experience of of uh, first uh, of New Testament studies of the historical Jesus is, um, and you know this is uh, very common, particularly for people first getting into it, right? Maybe in the undergrad is is really situating Jesus in his in his milieu. As, as much as we can, right? Understanding, you know, Second Temple Judaism and looking to the actions and teachings of Jesus and, and understanding of how they're, of, of their time and, and finding some of the influences, right? Um, but I always like to, you know, I think that's a very important process, but sometimes I feel like it, it can go too far and sometimes we miss some of the really original stuff that Jesus was, was doing. So I'm wondering about these, these, uh, gendered uh, 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 couplets, the gendered uh, doubles. Um, is this the gender pairings? The, uh, is this something that the Jesus picked up from, uh, from Hebrew scripture? Is it, uh, is it a convention in literature of the area? Uh, like, where do you think he got this? It's really good that you brought that up, that when we try to situate Jesus within his context, we can sometimes, uh, he sometimes blends in. Uh, and just becomes the same as his context. And of course, there's a balance between, of course, he was in, he had to be in some ways innovative because he attracted a following, but we, we just don't wanna go so far in his innovation and say he was nothing like any other Jews around him. And then in so doing, basically participate in anti-Judaism, whether intentional or not. Yes. Um, so I did find in my book, these pairs are indeed a rhetorical innovation. Mm. Um, it's not that it's not that Jewish authors before, such as in the Hebrew Bible, didn't use parallelism. Uh, Hebrew poetry is defined by its use of parallelism, parallel concepts, saying the same thing twice um, in two different ways. That's a very kind of ancient uh, Israelite mode of poetry, and so. Jesus' pairs are parallelism. Um, what is unique about his use of them is that they're centered around gender hmm. um, and that they're not just centered around kind of grammatical gender as a way of making a poetic statement two ways and pairing it. They're centered around biological, um, the construction of binary gender that they had at the time. There are women and there are men. It, it was a binary concept. And he was definitely participating in that by saying, I'm gonna teach this story for the for the women in my audience, and I'm gonna teach the same story for the men in my audience. And 
it's about the audience. It's about them being able to see themselves represented in the teachings and them being able to take the teachings and go um, act on them for the, the Basileia of God or the kingdom of God, which was so such a common topic in, in Jesus' teaching. So yeah, there's a, there's a dance you have to do as a historian between uh, uh, trying to not be influenced by so much rich tradition and dogma around Jesus as the main character in a major global religion. Uh, you don't want to read too much modern stuff back onto Jesus as a historian, but at the same time, you don't want to downplay anything that was unusual about him. And he was obviously um, a, an effective, charismatic uh, guy whose, whose movement carried on after he was crucified by the Romans, which normally would nip a movement in the bud. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, I, I think yeah. that, you know, I, I just, what, what Sarah was talking about just really illustrates, you know, um, something connected between, you know, what she and I try and do is sort of historical research and those broader theological concerns that a lot of people have, which it's like, if you're saying Jesus was different, you're saying he's unique and he's, you know, therefore he is divine and he's, you know, and you've, you're affirming theology and aren't you secretly, you know, engaging in Christian apologetics and, you know, whatever, and there's all this kind of stuff or, you know, moving too far in the other direction. And we don't face this in quite the same way with anyone else, right? If, if you say somebody is, you know, a, a kind of a, an innovative musician, right? Nobody says, thinks you're um, secretly anti, you know, you're saying, well, they're anti-music, right? Because they're somehow set over, pit, pitted over against everything that went before them or something like that, right? Um, and, you know, if you're saying that they are, you know, a, they reflect their time, right? Well, if they're popular, then they must be doing something that, people think is stands out, right? It's not just blending into the, and figuring out how to say that about Jesus when it's so fraught with all these added theological pitfalls is really hard, right? So theology makes historians work really hard, uh, sometimes to do, but even when we figure out how to do it, it's hard to talk about it, right? Because everybody listening is thinking in these terms and uh, just putting something in the wrong way. People say, so you're saying that, you know, and, it's just so challenging. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I would like to say, on that note, I'd like to say something about your book, James, in where it fits in the grand history of people talking about Jesus. Because um, his, quote unquote, historical Jesus research has this long history of questing. And the first quest uh, became a joke to, to all others because what ended up happening was each quester found a Jesus that looked remarkably like him. And then it, it all fell apart and people said, we can't know anything about Jesus because uh, it's too subjective and it's, it hasn't worked, it has failed. But uh, of course, Jesus remains extremely important to people and influential and popular. And so historical Jesus, did not give up, it continued uh, to the point where we find ourselves now in what we refer to as the third quest, which is in my opinion, the most successful attempt so far because it recognizes that Jesus is to be looked at within early Judaism. Uh, and it brings in for finally uh, other voices that aren't, um, you know, German Protestant, <laughs> <laughs> white male voices. Now, historical Jesus research it involves um, Jews doing the research, women, Catholics who, that weren't really into it before. There are, and global voices are coming in. And when global diverse voices can agree on certain things about Jesus, that has more meaning. When a diverse group can say, yes, we can all agree, he was Jewish, was crucified under the Romans, was baptized uh, by John the Baptist, uh, collected followers, you know, there are certain things that we feel we solidly can all agree on. That's great. But any intro class or like intro textbook still to this day about historical Jesus research is going to be men, only men. But that is not because women don't work on Jesus. But we women who work on Jesus don't get included because we are seen as, and we 
are guilty of it too. There's an idea that women who work on Jesus are uh, engaged scholars. So we have a, a bias and we're, we're, our positionality is coming into it. But what Elizabeth Schuessler Firenze has said is that notion that feminist scholarship is engaged and the other scholarship that's so-called historical critical is neutral is a falsehood. It's a falsehood that kind of reinforces all kinds of institutions such as patriarchy. And what she and other feminist Jesus researchers have said is, this is about being engaged, having an interest in Jesus, having a positionality, uh, having ethical concerns about how people are treated today because of their gender. And you're all using your imagination. It's just that we admit it. But then along comes James McGrath, a white male, and he writes a book about Jesus that is scholarly, but also says, hey, we really need to use our imagination here. And, and you've done it, James. And I, I think it's an important feminist practice to embrace how much imagination we as historians have to use and to embrace the fact that we're, we aren't... We try to be neutral historians when we uncover evidence for Jesus, but we also are engaged in that it, we, it matters how people treat each other today. This stuff matters. And so just kudos, James. I love the book and I, I hope this, I hope more like it uh, are forthcoming. Well, thank you. That, that's, uh, thank you. That that just is such such an encouragement to to to, to hear and um, you know I appreciate I appreciate that um, yeah they they don't, they don't let sound bites there's no way to add a sound bite to the back of the book but I would happily have that just like appended somehow a link to you saying that and um, uh, thank you um, it's it's what I was trying to accomplish um, and so it's it's just always encouraging to know that what you what you are hoping for is you know there, there's some glimmer of hope that maybe maybe it's actually uh, what what came out the other end of the pro writing process. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I, I think that's the perfect ending for the show, obviously. So um, we're already at an hour uh, somehow, but it's been uh, amazing wow. having you both. It's been an awesome uh, uh, discussion. So before we go, if, if you folks have uh, some plugs, I guess, uh, James, if you can tell people about the book and where to get it. Yeah. Oh, wait, wrong book. Okay, well, will people buy that book No, no, too? they should get that book. Yeah, get that book. Okay, here we go, James. <laughs> hey, that, wait, that's not fair. Mine is in bigger letters. What's? Yeah. Let's hang on, hang on. I'm not happy shorter. with this. Yeah. It's because it's shorter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually the longest book I've written, like single author book, mm -hmm. and I was really happy about that. I keep making the joke. Like if I'd written another one of these little slim intro volumes that I sometimes do, then people would have said, you see, you know, what did Jesus learn from women? Not that much, right? This thin book or something like that. And so I was glad that it's like, it's it's it's, it's a thick book, it's hefty, it's weighty. Um, there's there's a lot in there. <laughs> and if I just, people want to- I just meant oh, the letters were bigger because the title was shorter. No, the title's shorter, no, I know. But uh, wait, can I make can I make your scroll? What can I do to make it special? No, well, let me scroll it. Okay. Well, uh, <laughs> I have it right here. Buy, there buy it this book. Here's yeah. how it looks. Okay. Oh, look at that. <laughs> oh, perfect. Companion volumes. I do think they I do think they make for a nice pairing, right? There's a do. good nice they gender do. pair. Oh, yes. of course. There we go. <laughs> That's right. A nice gender pair. And of course, but if you want... should be read by women and men, right? So... That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. And uh, to find you on uh, line, Dr. McGrath, uh, you have your Religion Prof um, uh, blog, which is quite excellent. And you're at Religion Prof on social media. And uh, Dr. Parks, you have uh, uh, Facebook.com slash Second, Second Temple Judaism. Um, and then my plug is just uh, we're viewer and listener support it so please feel free to go to patreon.com slash gnostic and you can support us for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month and you can put a cap on that too if you need to stay within a budget and if you can't help us out financially tell people about the show share like subscribe all of that good stuff so yes this has been so awesome i've learned so much i know that our audience has learned so much and it's also just been fun to hang out with you too so um hopefully some year some sbl <laughs> In the, in the world to come, we'll be able to do it in person. Um, uh, but 
unfortunately, uh, time to say adieu, time to sign off. So I'm Deacon Jonathan Stewart saying goodbye. Thanks both. Bye. Thank it you. was Thank great you. fun. Bye.